Ask Mike, brought to you by the Stadium Shop on Razorback in Fayetteville. Happy Monday, everybody. It's another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike We're Irwin here. We're in mourning, all black. We are in mourning, yes. That is why I, we it, wore all black. It's not that you lose a game. It's that you lose to the Aggies. Yeah, it's Ugh. even worse than losing Ugh. just a game. So Ugh. let's get right into it because that's exactly what we're talking about today here on Ask Mike. Our first question is from Kevin who says, can somebody ask Coach Pittman when we are chewing up yards like Pac-Man, he does not veto Coach Bryles when he calls plays like double reverses and double passes. He killed our momentum in the first half on our fourth series. Yeah, that was a pretty common type complaint on social media. A lot of people talking about, and a lot of people actually blaming the loss on that. That's a stretch. Look, these kind of trick plays, they've always backfired on Kendall Bryles. I don't know why. Going all the way back to the first year when he tries them, they just don't work. And so a lot of people have adopted the attitude, what is up with this guy? I mean, when is he going to give up? And we didn't see any of that in the first uh, couple of games. Yeah. So you're sitting there thinking, okay, this is, this, I'd even forgotten about it. And honestly, I didn't really think about the uh, Malik Hornsby stuff being trick plays, but, but I didn't see a lot of what he did in the spring either. I will say this, some of these fans got what they asked for. Because when this was first mentioned, this whole Malik Hornsby thing, it was mentioned before spring football even started. And ever since they talked about it, I, every time I turn around, I'm reading some fan on social media, well, why are we doing the trick plays with Hornsby? That's great. He's fast. Blah, blah, blah. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Malik Hornsby's best contribution is that he's gotten a lot better as backup quarterback. Now, I know the fans haven't seen that. But when we watched him in August camp, that was the thing that struck me. He looks a lot more comfortable. He look, he's throwing the ball better as a quarterback. So why do you want to use him as a wide receiver? They've got wide receivers out the wazoo that they're not using. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Matt Landers caught one pass in this game after having a career day against Missouri State. So you got a guy, one of the best receivers in college football, catching one pass. Why do you want your backup quarterback to be a receiver? So some of these people got what they asked for because they wanted to see him do this. But I understand the legitimate complaint of you brought Dominic Johnson in for the first time of, of the season. Everybody's been clamoring for him, and what's he do? He's going five yards, six yards, five yards. Gets all the way over into A&M territory. He's just going right through him, and then all of a sudden he goes to the bench, and here's these three Malik Hornsby plays that don't work, and the drive is over. So that's what they're talking about. Then later on, they put Hazelwood, well, Hazelwood a lot of times lines up in the slot, but he ends up in one of these trick plays like we, we saw with Traylon Burks last year where they're trying to turn him into a passer. Mm -hmm. And that thing never worked with Burks. Well, it didn't work this time. And so that is the complaint. And I agree, it's baffling to me why you're doing this. I have a good friend, and he called me, and this guy should be on the staff. Because here's what he said, and I love this. He said, here's what I would do with Malik Hornsby. I'd bring him in. I'd line him up in the slot. And then I'd have him do a little down and out over to the sidelines, and I'd throw a bomb over here. Because oh. they're looking at him. Oh, something's coming to him. Get ready. They're going to do this thing with Hornsby because he's fast. And you just use him as a decoy. That's actually really good. That would that's be a really good play smart. to me. <laughs> can, you, can you reveal that, Fred? Because that's a good one. Well, I like that. Guy that runs that place, owns that place. Oh, Robert from the stadium I shop. I love it. Well, there you go. That's, that's a good one. They should, they should listen to that and hear that one. Yeah. About complaints from some that the media and part of the fan base has turned on this coaching staff after one loss. Frank Clement says, nobody has turned on anybody. But this is a line of scrimmage football team with a bomb throwing quarterback back Arkansas got beat being cute trying to out scheme a team that could run through and throw over yeah this is a kind of a different version of that same complaint uh, he's still talking about trick plays but it, it gives me the opportunity to talk about this I w I've gone back and charted not just in this game but in the other games successful drives drives where you score a touchdown or maybe go 50 yards and kick a field goal and there's a common denominator in almost all of these. And it starts with good running. They run the ball well. And you get a rhythm going. And then suddenly you come back, not with a short pass, not with a short sideline route or a route across in front of where the linebackers are, 
but an intermediate route behind the linebackers or deeper. Mm. This is where they burn people. These are the type of play calling sequences that work. So why did they have so many of them where they're not doing that? I don't know. What kept happening in this game was the same thing that happened in the Missouri State game, which is you give the ball to Rocket, he goes into a stacked defense and gains two yards. You give the ball to Rocket, he goes against a stacked defense and gains one yard. So it's third and seven. And you're asking KJ to complete a pass on third and seven. So they're running these routes where he's very quickly going to throw to somebody just over the line, uh, the first down line to try to get it. And he doesn't throw those passes very well. And that's where a lot of his incompletions, he had seven incompletions in these game, this, this game, and most of them were on those thir in those third down situations. So again, I, I'm not claiming to be a genius. I'm not Bryles. I don't have the information that they have when they game plan an opponent. But it just seems like to me that you look at your body of work at any given time, okay, this is what we've done so far successfully. This is what hasn't worked. Let's start ignoring this stuff that doesn't work and let's try this. Um, it, you know, that's the part that baffles me. And again, some of it is like you, you say to yourself, did you not look at what happened last week? Okay, what was the play of the game? Honestly, the play that cost them the game. It was the fumble, right? The K.J. Jefferson fumble, snatch, go the other direction. Right. They had a play similar to that against Missouri State. They didn't run, take it back. But you're on the goal line, near the goal line, with first and goal, and your first play is to run right at that defense. That's what he did this time, only this time he tried to dive at them. Well, from Superman three, jump is three, what I've been yeah, calling it. Superman jump from the three-yard line. The other thing is, K.J. does have a tendency to stick the ball out near the goal line. To me, that's the most dangerous play in sports, in football. Why would you do that? If I'm, a, if I'm a quarterback's coach, I tell my quarterback, don't ever do that. Do not stick that. Maybe if your, your knee is one inch from the ground and, and you can see it right here and you know you can stick it over, you might can take a chance. But when you stick that ball out there, you're taking a risk. He had one, I think, in the Missouri State game where he tried to touch the pylon and he got it knocked away in that one. Yeah. It's just a very dangerous thing to do. So you're asking yourself, why does your quarterback's coach not tell KJ to stop doing that? Because it really, in this game, it cost him the game. You can't tell me that that's not cost, that didn't cost it, him it the did. game. You're about to be up 21 nothing, and suddenly you're up by one point. That changed the game. The defense suddenly started having problems then. So there are little things like this. And yet we could sit and analyze this game all day long and talk about mistakes and play calling and all this. They still should have won the game yeah. because it boils down to something that almost never happens, which is that weird field goal doing what right. it did. So, But, you know, I was reading on social media after the game that somebody said that NFL uh, uprights are a little bit higher than college and that if that's the case, you probably he win the probably game. probably would have so, won the game. So, right. I mean, it's it's kind of a really interesting situation there. But North Hawk says, not bashing Pitt at all here as he brought the program back from the dead. I think, though, some in-game decision-making maybe is just him learning from mistakes as a newish head coach will do. And, and as a result, will improve over time. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, when I think about Pittman, I, th I, I, I start doing check marks as a head coach, and, and he was an unknown quantity when he took the job, and a lot of people said, well, whoa, wait a minute here. There's a big difference between an offensive line coach and being head coach. But to me, he checks every one of the boxes so far as I look down the, except one, there's only one thing that I'm not sure of, and that is his ability to manage a game from a play calling standpoint. Now, I'm not saying call the plays. Some coaches like Bobby Petrino okay, do, although I don't even think Petrino's calling his own plays now. Maybe he is, I'm not sure. But some coaches call their own plays, and he doesn't do that. But you've still got to manage that. You've still got to be able to say, wait a minute, this is working, that's not working. And that's the part I'm not sure about. He was asked about that after the game. He defended Kendall Bryles, said he was one of the best play callers in the country, and I'm not saying he's not. But what is he doing behind the scenes with these type issues? Uh, is he just fine? Does he, did he feel like they lost the game because of mistakes? Or does he agree that some of the play calling was strange? I don't know. The only time I've ever heard him make a comment was at, at, at halftime of the, the bowl game last year. He came back out 
and made some remark about we got to start giving the ball to, like, we got to let KJ Jeffers, we can run the ball. And he pretty much implied, he told, he didn't say I told Kendall Bryles that, but he implied it. So that's one time where you're kind of giving direction to your offensive coordinator slash play caller and telling him this is what you better do. So how much of that does he do? Is he passive? Is he just sitting back and saying, well, okay, I guess that's all right. I think he's good. I don't know. I can't answer that question. But that's the one question mark I have about Sam Pittman as a head coach right now. And it's not that I'm saying he doesn't pass that part of it. I don't know what his position is. I don't know what he's thinking because I'm not there. And unless he opens up or somebody inside the program opens up, how are we going to know what that relationship is between Sam Pittman and Kendall Bryles and when some of these play calls are made and they seem a little bit bizarre? Yeah, I think you're exactly right on that, Mike. Uh, Lawson Swine asks, did you hear any rumors or scuttlebutt <laughs> about KJ being hurt at all for the Texas A&M game? He just didn't look like the normal full speed ahead. KJ on runs and his passes were even off at times. He got whacked there at one point in the game, and I think they said on TV that he went into the tent briefly. I noticed right after that he, he took off on a running play and then he wrapped up instead of just normally charging into the guys that are going to tackle him, he kind of did like this and he just let them kind of stop him. And I thought maybe that might indicate that he knew he had some sort of an issue and he had to protect himself. Here's the problem. I don't go to those press conferences. I'm, CJ and I stay back here. We're the <laughs> studio analysts. Not everybody gets to go. And I volunteered several years ago. Okay, I've been to a million games. I don't care. I can watch and be just happy on TV. So I'm not in that post-game press conference. And I don't go over on Mondays because we do ask Mike. We do Mike. this, yeah. So I wasn't there to ask him. Apparently, according to CJ, nobody asked him if CJ was or if KJ was hurt. Oh. So I'm, you could say, I assume that he's not hurt, or he would have said it. No. If I'm telling you, if I'm Sam Pittman and KJ's got an issue, I'm not telling anybody. I'm, I'm just not gonna, offering up that information either. I will just. Unless he's actually going to miss the game, I wouldn't tell anybody what it is. So this is a long roundabout way of saying I don't know if he was hurt. <laughs> if he was hurt, I don't know how serious it is. And I don't think we're going to know because I just don't think he, he's going to reveal that information. The only way you know if a guy's hurt is if he misses the game. If he's not, if he's going to play and he's going to play hurt, they're not going to tell you what's going on yeah. there. Well, he went to the post-game press conference yeah. after Texas A&M, I mean, so that maybe I, is a good sign. I don't think he's like debilitated or yeah. anything, but he could have something that held him back a little bit. Yeah. The thing that, that kind of made me wonder was when he wrapped his arms around himself like they had the ball here and he kind of did that. I don't, that's not something he normally does. Yeah, no, definitely. That is uh, very out of the normal for KJ. Pig's Feet asks, on the fumble return for a touchdown, did I not see a referee running in with his hand in the air indicating the play dead before the handoff? Please look again. Yeah, we did. I did go look again and CJ and I looked at it yesterday. What you see is, okay, it, there's a referee on the sidelines. Okay, here's the play right here. There's the fumble, the guy gets it. Well, if you look on TV, you see a ref behind all of that on the sidelines. So he would have seen the handoff. It's what yes. pretty much, I don't think it was a lateral. I think he just turned and handed it off. That referee doesn't do this. He does this. He does this. To me, that indicated there was a kind of a backward handoff as the guy's taken off. So I think he was saying, this is what happened. It's yeah. legal. You know, there wasn't, the play wasn't down. He didn't do anything like this. He went like that. So, mm, I, interesting. I, I think he, I th I've looked at it. I think it's I a, must have missed that touchdown. because I didn't see, I didn't yeah. see him I think do it's that. a touchdown. I didn't see anything to indicate the play stopped or anything like that. Yeah. Well, there you go. Marty Bride's proxy wants to know, since Halloween is coming up, what about the curse of a Razorback football? I get it. There's really no such thing. But Tennessee 98, Reggie Fish, Matt Jones fumble as we're about to score on Texas in 04. We just keep finding wacky ways to lose. I mean, you could go all the way back to the 69 game when uh, Frank Royals made a decision to try to throw a, a touchdown pass instead of just you're, you're right in front of the goal line, let Bill McClard, the best kicker in college football, kick the field goal. Hmm. And, and you had an <laughs> interception, which then gave them the ball back, and they went down and scored the winning touchdown. So, but look, I think all programs have that. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about the history of your favorite football program, you're going to have games like this. 
I think rather than things always happening, I would focus on just this series because in this series at Jerry World, there's been a bunch of stuff like that. I don't think it's a curse or a jinx, it's just not good. And once again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not making excuses for them, but the fact of the matter is, A&M got incredibly lucky in that game. There were a bunch of things that happened yeah. to them. They fumbled three times, got all three fumbles back. There was one late that could have been, a, and then there was almost a sack. I mean, it came within about that far of being a sack. Now, you can say it was a great play by the quarterback, but it was a, just a microsecond situation where, and he could have dropped the ball and had it gone back, and then you pick it up and run it in. There's a dozen things that could have happened in those situations, and they didn't including the field goal thing that we just talked about. How weird was that? Yeah, so the only weird. thing I can say is that, yes, A&M won. I'm going to sit here and tell you I don't think they're that good. We'll see when the season's over, and I will acknowledge if they, if they beat Alabama like they say they're going to do and they win the West and they go on and do all these things, I'll say, hey, I was wrong. Right now, I think I'll say that A&M has a really good defense, their, their quarterback is good. They've, they've made a change there, That's a, and they've got a good running back and a good receiver. But overall, I don't think they're anywhere close to the best team Arkansas is going to play this year. I think they'll play a lot better team this week, and I think BYU may be as good. Mm -hmm. So why did Arkansas lose? Things we've just talked about, and weird things happen in that game. You have to, A lot of strange things happen, and you win a game. Okay, get fired up, say you're great, you're going to go and win the national championship, but we know the truth. Yeah, we know the truth. Uh, that's definitely not happening if I have anything to say about that. Razor Alex 88 wants to know, what are the chances of our boys coming out locked in with a predator mentality and ready to give Bama a hell of a game on Saturday? It's time for Razorback Nation to bottle up the anger of the A&M loss and unleash it. In Razorback Stadium. Yeah, a lot of the fans are fi fired up like that, and yeah. that's that's really great. But I even heard some say that they would sacrifice a Texas A&M loss to beat Bama. That's okay, crazy. They're fired <laughs> up, and and I hope they're fired up at the game because they can have an effect. But asking me if the players are like that, let me just tell you that, that up until about the early 90s, maybe definitely in the 70s and 80s, I could walk over to that Broil Center go down to the players level where the locker rooms were, which are still up above that indoor workout area, and there was a big concourse, and the players would come out of the locker room, they would go to the equipment window, and they'd be talking to the guy, and the, the managers back there, the equipment managers, they had a thing that they would weigh on every day, and they're moving around. We could talk to them all we wanted. We'd sit and st we'd stop a guy and just have a conversation with him, and you would get a feel in a situation like this for how the players are reacting. We don't get that anymore. You cannot talk to these guys except at a press conference. If I were to if I were to go over there and try to stop a player and have a and try to question him, I'd be banned from that place. That's yeah. the, that's how my job has changed and everybody else in the media over the last couple of decades. They just shut it down. So I can't answer that question of what what I think the players will do because I don't have a clue. The only way you would know is if one of them was your friend, if you were a college student and you knew him and you were around him, you might know then. If you're his parents, maybe we should start calling these parents up. I don't know. But I, we just, those of us in the media, we do not have contact with these players except at press conferences. What are you going to say in a press conference? Yeah. You're going to be politically correct, whatever that is. So some I don't them, know. Some of them I know the fans are pumped media. up. I know the fans are pumped up. That's what they need to do. They need to do their job for this red out at the, at the Alabama game, and then we'll see what the players do. Yeah, I saw some of the players posting on social media and kind of like, you know, basically saying that like we're we're ready we're we're gonna we're gonna reassess and we're yeah. gonna come back ready so but, i mean you really got to be almost inside that team to know yeah. what oh, how, yeah. how they're i mean they're gonna put out whatever they want to on social media and things like that so jared asks can we talk about how many times aggie players have been laying out on the field injured with only one maybe two being anything remotely serious they're gonna change the rule on that a little bit but look you're always gonna if you run a tempo offense you just better get ready for the fact that teams are gonna do that some are and there's not anything you can do about it mm. you just deal with it I, I know it's a complaint I know fans don't like it but how are you gonna put referees into a position where they've got to try and determine whether somebody was really hurt or not now if you passed a rule that said if you left the game because of an injury, you couldn't come back in for the next quarter or something like that, maybe that would change it. I don't know. But I don't think that any rule changes are going to be that severe.
Yeah, I think so as They're well. They're talking about maybe coming back and reviewing this stuff after a game and then sending a note to your the, the, the national people would, would review games and then send a note back to your conference recommending something, but it would be up to the conference as to whether or not they wanted to discipline a coach for the next week. And, I mean, come on, who's going to do that? I mean, I like your idea. If you, if you actually said they couldn't come back for a quarter if they leave the game because they're injured, I think it may – make some people reconsider faking But on injuries. the other hand, what if a guy just gets temporarily stunned and, he, and he's okay right, and then yeah. you're punishing him because he, he recovers? Or so, things like cramps or things like yeah. that. I mean, you I mean, know. How are you going to determine a real cramp from a fake cramp? <laughs> I mean, some that I've seen with some teams, uh, uh, Ole Miss was just terrible with it last year. I mean, you could just see... We saw one video where Lane Kiffin was telling the tell guy, me, get down. That's the what guy's, I was going to say. Guy's walking around looking at what, duh. He's and then like, somebody, down, somebody down. points out and he goes, oh, and he just falls down. Well, you know that. And if you're a referee looking at that, you, then you come back and you could do something. But it, most of the time it's not that obvious. No, no. I mean, yeah, it's definitely tough to tell if somebody's actually injured versus faking one. S. Giles says that snotty Aggie yell leader <laughs> was at it again. Oh, he definitely was telling a long and confusing joke about Arkansas fans being hillbillies and marrying their cousins. Do they really do this every week? <laughs> well, I can't say because I've heard about Aggie yell practice my whole life. I've said this before, the only time I was ever anywhere close to one was in the 2012 game. We were down there live outside the stadium at, at around 1020, and I could hear somebody on, the, on, a, on a megaphone, on a megaphone yeah. talking, and I could hear fans back there, but we didn't know what they were saying. So the last two weeks, somebody's gone in there with the cell phone camera and recorded it. I don't know if the, if the school wants to do that. They got kind of mad last week. I haven't heard anything about this week. So these are, these are the only two times I've been exposed, and both times it was embarrassing. Because if you're at, look, I get it that you're going to start off making fun of the opponent, okay? And there are ways to make fun of the opponent, right? Yeah. I mean. Good jokes. But, but, That's but, a way. But, but these things, in both cases, they were way too long. And then what I noticed was nobody was really kind of laughing. You got 30,000 people in there, and they're not really laughing. They just kind of go, hey, okay. Hey, yeah. and, it, and, and so what is, what is a proper way to make fun of an opponent? Well, Please Bobby, tell us, Bobby Schmidl, who's a longtime Razorback fan, this is what he posted. If you've got a graph, I think we got a graphic on that. Do we have a graphic on yeah, that? I, I think so. Can. Yeah, I think Bri Brian Garner on t No. We don't have it. Okay. Oh, well, I'm sorry. We don't have it. But you okay. can. You can. Okay. Well, read here's the joke. what it is. He he got on, uh, face. I think his was on Facebook, and he said, "Do you know how to make an Aggie's eyes light up? Shine a flashlight into his ear." Now that's a very that takes about five Great. seconds to say. It's sort of funny. It's not uproariously funny, but it's okay. And, and and everybody knows you don't. You're not really saying that Aggies don't have a brain in their head. You're just making a joke. That is much better than telling a two-minute joke about somebody marrying their cousin because they're an Arkansas fan. Yeah. There's, there's just the difference. So I'm not telling A&M what to do as a school. They can do whatever they want. But it's one thing for students to be saying stuff among themselves. This is a sanctioned activity mm -hmm. on campus, and word has gotten out, and now the video showing what they're doing. If I'm the president of the, of the school or the AD or somebody, I'm going in and telling the yell leaders, can you come up with some better stuff? Yeah. You can still be funny, but make it shorter and don't talk about somebody marrying their cousin or anything. You yeah, know, don't just, don't get into that. Just use some other kind of joke. Yeah, I like that joke way better. Who who said that joke? Bobby Smittle. He's Bobby known as Smittle. Hognoxious to a lot of Razorback. Oh, fans. Really, Hognoxious. Really I love funny it. guy. Love it. Love it, Hognoxious. Brian Garner says, never again will I refrain from okay, Aggie jokes. Okay, that's it. Now, pop, oh, okay. Pop, pop it up. That's Oh, that's that's it? The, no, we, never... got a, we got another graphic after that. It's a, yeah, remember, you can oh, always make I... an Aggie's eyes sparkle if you shine a <laughs> flashlight in his ear. <laughs> I love it. Even a second time, it's great. Yeah. That's awesome. Bobby Smittle, great joke. Hognoxious. That's a good one. Well, let's go on to the next question. Now, Tim Tino on Hogville says, it's great knowing the bumper pool is so close to the record for most tackles in a career, and I hope he achieves it. How many games do you think it will take him to achieve this momentous as, task? as of today, he's 24 tackles short. Kind of calculating what he typically does on a game. I'm going to say it's going to take six games. It could be five games, okay. even four, or it could be seven or eight. 
I mean, you know, you can't you can't just decide. <laughs> Mike just says it could be any any. Well, you can't just <laughs> figure out how many tackles he's going to have right. every week, but it'll be somewhere in that range, four to seven games, I okay. think. I think you'll get it. I yeah. Think there's enough games left. I think he'll get it this season. I think he will too. That's great. He's only 24 away. 24 short. Yeah, I think he'll get it you for get sure. Five games, five tackles a game, six games somewhere in that yeah. range. Then it's going to be about four or five four more five, games. Yeah. I think you'll definitely do it. Blood Red Hog asks, how can anyone say the SEC is fair to Arkansas with the recent release of the 2023 football schedule? We've played Florida at the Swamp three of the past four meetings, yet we play at the Swamp next year. Does the SEC even try for fairness? No, they don't. It's something that I complained about when, we, when Arkansas went into this conference because they allegedly got out of the SEC, SWC because... The belief was, as, as the only team outside the state of Texas, always Arkansas always got the shaft. So it wasn't going to be that way in the SEC. Roy Kramer, who was the SEC commissioner at the time, and a really good guy, the best commissioner they ever had. He's the guy that came up with the BCS and had the first real championship, always before it just been something with the polls. Roy Kramer, on the day that Arkansas, it was announced that Arkansas was going to join the SEC, he said in the SEC, the the, a rising tide lifts all boats. In other words, mm. we all go, as all of us go, we get better as a conference. And he didn't just say that. That's what he believed. The conference to me was fair back then. It, it hasn't worked that way since. I can give you, I mean, all, uh, Sam Pittman, is he ever going to get a break as a head coach? Toughest schedule in the country last year. Toughest schedule in the country this year. And not probably well, next year, well, too. Not, not maybe as tough, but weird from a standpoint of the, all these road games they, that they you're getting. They just have a lot of road games. And again, games. why are you playing Florida every time you turn around at Florida? When are they going to come here? Come on. Florida doesn't have buses, apparently. So <laughs> here's the thing about this. I don't think it's going to change until you get somebody in that office that has some pull that is a Razorback fan. I think that's the only way it changes. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but there is a rumor going around, and I've heard it, that um, Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, when they finally finish this thing they're doing where they're reorganizing Division I football to create its own thing separate from the NCAA, and, and it's a part of creating this playoff, this 12-team playoff, but it goes way beyond creating a 12-team playoff. They're going to create a separate division. Nobody knows how many teams it's going to include or how it's, going to, how it's going to be structured or anything like that. But when it's done, the rumor is he's going to be the president of that, the president of that oh. organization. It might happen, might not happen. Mm -hmm. The rumor is that when he takes that job, Hunter Juracek is going to be the commissioner of the SEC. Now, I've wow. asked around over there at Arkansas. Oh, they say they don't know anything about it. It's just a rumor that's floating around. So if that happens, Razorback fans, what's your attitude? What, you're losing probably the best AD you've had, certainly since Frank Broyles left, and yeah. maybe as good as Frank in different ways. Would you be willing to give a guy up that's done all that to have a guy that you would have influence with at the SEC office? I don't think it would be a good trade. He might be able to help you some, but he couldn't be totally biased. It would just eliminate the bias against Arkansas. Probably not going to happen, but I will go back to what I originally said. The only way I think this changes is if you get somebody in that SEC office that knows what's going on and says, wait a minute, what are you doing yeah, here? hold on. Come on. You, gotta, you can't just be telling Sam Pittman, I'm sorry you have to play Georgia and Alabama this year. I'm sorry you have to play them again next year. I'm sorry. And you, you have to go on the road to do it. Yeah, I'm sorry, but this is what you have to do. I'm sorry we gave you uh, Missouri. You didn't want Missouri as, uh, as your is your thank, th Thanksgiving week rival. I'm sorry, but we're doing it anyway, doing it whether anyway. you like it or not. That kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I made a joke that uh, with Alyssa last week when the schedule came out that somebody in the SEC office was clearly playing a joke on me. And they were like, ah, we're going to put Courtney in the swamp, see what she feels like. So. Yeah, I know. Well, you and Alyssa <laughs> can fight that out. Because you Florida, Florida hey, State yo I'm just saying, I think it's kind of ironic. I'm like, okay, well... It's just kind of ironic Whatever. to me. Kind of ironic. Gloria Swineson says, I remember a game possibly in the late 70s where the Hogs scored every possible way. Touchdown, PAT, two-point conversion, field goal, and safety to win, possibly in a single half of football. I've searched the internet with no luck. Do you recall this game?
Imagine how difficult it is to find this because you would have to. I can't to believe you even did. You, well, I didn't, but oh, I knew yes. how to go okay. find the answer. <laughs> and the, the, here's the thing you got to have somebody with an incredible memory, and nobody's better at that than Rick Schaefer, who was the sports information director at Arkansas for most of the early time that I was here. A terrific guy that has a memory like an eye. He's unbelievable the stuff he remembers. So I asked him, and he came up with it pretty quickly. It was the 79 Baylor game, and here's how it worked. Arkansas was down 17 to nothing early in the game. They were down 17 to nothing in the third quarter. It looked bad. It was homecoming uh, in 1979. They got six points on a 32-yard touchdown pass from Kevin Scanlon to Bobby Duckworth, but the extra point failed. Then Ish Ordonis kicked a 30-yard field goal after Randy Wessinger came up with an interception. Now we go to the fourth quarter. Danny Phillips recorded a fump, re, uh, re, recovered a fumble in the end zone, but here's the key part. Robert Farrell caught a pass on a two-point conversion that tied the game there. Fader, Farrell later caught, caught another touchdown pass, and Ardonis this time kicked a one-point conversion. <laughs> and finally, late in the game, Arkansas added two more points on a safety. And I haven't been able to come up with the name of, of who recorded that safety in the end zone, but... That is your game, Baylor, wow. 1979. Now, here's information he didn't ask for that I got from Rick Schaefer, because this is pretty cool. Bob Holt, the comedian, Bob Hope, not Bob Holt, Bob Hope. Hope. I said Bob Holt, because that name is in my brain. Bob <laughs> Hope, the comedian, who you have to be of my generation to know Bob Hope, but he's yeah, a guy sorry. that went and, went and entertained troops all over during World War II, great awesome. guy. Bob Hope came in and he spoke in, in Barnhill the night before the homecoming game. And he offered this joke and he said, he was getting ready to fly out of the airport in, Lo in Los Angeles and he had three bags to check at the airport. And he went up to the lady at the bag checker and he said, okay, I want to check this bag in to go to New York. I want to check this bag in to go to Detroit. And I want to check this bag in to go to Washington, D.C. And she said, well, sir, we can't do that. He goes, why not? You did it last week. <laughs> That's a Bob Hope joke. <laughs> That's great. How did you remember that? He remembered it. I oh, wasn't there. Oh, remembered it. Rick That's remembered right. it. I wasn't, remembered there, it. I, I was, wasn't there when Bob Hope did, Hope did this stuff. Wait, that's great. So, oh, my gosh. That's a little extra information on this 79 homecoming game. Oh, where wow. They, where they scored every way possible to beat Baylor 29 to whatever it was, 20. Yeah, whatever. that wow, that's great. Got, got, got to love Rick Schaefer for those uh, gr that great memory. Dr. Strangepork says, I remember when I was younger, a parade that had Lou Holtz and Eddie Sutton together together in it. They seemed to get along. Was there a time you recall when a past coach didn't care for or get along with another coach at all at, or at Arkansas? Sorry. First of all, I don't I wouldn't say that they got along. I don't know that they had that much to do with each other. For most mm -hmm. of the time that I was there back in those days, the coaches just coached their own sport. I didn't see there was a lot of interaction with the other coach. I think just because you're in a parade with somebody and you don't punch them in the mouth doesn't mean you're buddies. But I'm not going to say they didn't get along. I never heard Eddie Sutton say anything about Lou bad, and I don't remember Lou saying anything about him. The only time I know of where two coaches didn't get along was Lou, who didn't get along with a lot of people. And he insulted John McDonald in a, uh, at a buffet line somewhere in Fort Worth. I think what happened was the track team was in Fort Worth at a Southwest Conference indoor track meet. And so they were in the same hotel with a football team that was in there to play TCU in a football game. And I guess at some point the, two, the track team and the football team, they were all downstairs somewhere in a buffet line and Lou was standing there in a buffet line with a lot of people around. Mm. And a lot of people were coming up to John and complimenting him on the fact that they were ahead, way ahead in the track meet. And boy, what a great job you're doing. And uh, Lou apparently got mad and, and said something to the effect, and John told me this story. Lou said something to the effect out loud so everybody could hear, well, that's real nice, but you coach in a sport where not too many people try to win it. It's not that competitive. Not too many people care enough about track to try to win a championship. Now, if, you, if you're talking about football, then everybody's trying to win it. So there's a big difference. And John was just laughing. I don't think he was really mad because he understood what I understood, which was Lou insulted everybody. It didn't matter. He could insult a, a manager on the football team. He could insult some five-year-old kid that he walked, walked down the sidewalk. 
And I've explained it before, Lou was an insomniac. He didn't get any sleep. He'd get two and three hours of sleep at night and he walked around mad all day long. Uh, I've noticed lately that he's, now that he's retired, he seems to be a lot nicer. Yeah, he so. does. He but that's the only time. <laughs> One time, Nolan Richardson, just a vague memory. Nolan, there was a big deal where he was made associate AD, an associate AD, and there were five or six of these in the athletic department. And he was mad because he felt like it was a ceremonial title. They didn't give him any real responsibilities. And he was real big on, hey, why are you doing this to me? Why don't you give me a real job here to do? And I think that over in the athletic department, they were saying, well, he's our head coach. We don't want him to mess with stuff over here. We want him to focus on basketball. But he felt like that he needed some support over in that building, uh, people that would lobby, hey, give this guy some real responsibilities. He wants to do it. And he said to me, uh, Nolan Richardson said that he didn't feel like Houston Nutt was helping him over there, mm -hmm. that he, sh he could have gone to Frank and lobbied and said, hey, come on, you know. And so he, he wasn't necessarily mad at him. He just said, I, I just wish, I, I, don't, I don't feel like Houston's over there helping me any, and I wish he would, something like that. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I don't think coaches have not gotten along. But what's different now is they really support each other, and that's new. Frank did a lot of good things, but even he didn't think of that. This is the Hunter Urechek's, it's got his stamp all over it. This idea of getting everybody to pull for everybody is a new concept. Yeah, well, you saw that picture of what was it, DBH, Eric Musselman, and Sam Pittman all hugging, you know, after after a game last last season, I believe it was taken. And you just look at that picture, and you're like, yeah, yeah. that that's one one Razorback, as they say, right? I mean, the, the volleyball team's now suddenly winning, and, and he's like complimenting other coaches, and yeah. the coaches are complimenting him. It's it's just a great thing to yeah, see. Yeah, and Sam Pittman was at a volleyball game too. I think a, a few maybe, but he was definitely at one this yeah, year. So absolutely. definitely support all around because of Hunter Yurchek. But our final question today, Armand Abbey says, and I love this one, you posted online that you were pulling for Auburn against Missouri. I don't like either team. Why does it matter to you? Okay, so we came in and did the game day show Saturday morning, right? Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, 10 yeah, to I 11. Remember. <laughs> and then we really, because the game is at 6 o'clock, we didn't have a lot to do till around 3 o'clock. So I went home. And I've got this, you have it too, we've got YouTube TV. And we it's, share it's, YouTube TV. It's got the 4K <laughs> games, which I live with the surround sound. So I went home to watch some games. And I've explained this before, I cannot watch a game, I don't care what game it is. You could come up with two random teams I don't care anything about. Within a few minutes, I'm gonna pick a team out I want to win because it's just naturally in me to say, I don't like those guys, I like these guys. I've done that since I was a kid. So I'm watching that game, and right off the bat, I'm going, I don't really like Auburn, man. What a bunch of goobers. But I don't like Missouri either. So who do I really pull for in this game? And I kind of had to think about it, and I thought, all right, Brian Harson, poor guy. He's the latest line of coaches that go to Auburn and find out Auburn hates all of their coaches. They always fire them. They fired three of the guys that won national championships. And, uh, you know, you just, there's nothing you can do to keep from being fired at Auburn. If you're not, what was that guy's name years ago? The name is Jordan, Jordan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Jor Jordan Hare stay yeah. in Jordan. Jer Jordan. <laughs> whatever he is. I met him one time years ago when I was working at, uh, in Dothan, Alabama. But uh, if you're not that guy, that Jordan guy, which is, I guess, their version of Frank Broyles, you're just a bozo and they want to get rid of you. So I started thinking, okay, Harson's not a bad guy. I think he got kind of a bad rap in the off season. They're all trying to get rid of him. So they're making up stories about what a jerk he is. And oh, he hired some girl that was at, you know, yeah. Boise State and then brought her here. Oh, that's terrible. And they didn't have any, I mean, all, just because you hire somebody that was on your staff doesn't mean he's Bobby Petrino. So I'm, I'm looking at all that and I'm thinking, okay, I kind of like Harson. He's he, they're they're doing bad things to him. And then I'm looking at Eli Drinkwitz. I call him Dinkywitz. Dinkywitz, yeah. And I somebody got all over me for that. Some high school coach in the state because he coached high school in this state. Drinkwitz did. He said, "Come on, Mike. He's a good guy. He does this and he does that." And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, he's got friends here. Hmm. But here's what I think. He was a Malzahnite. That was he was a somebody that learned under Malzahn. And what did Malzahn do to Arkansas? I've talked about that on this show. So that's kind of a deal. But the main thing was, when Sam Pittman went to Missouri that first year, his first year here, and Missouri eked out a win, and Arkansas could have won that game so easily, kind of like the one this past week. Yeah. And then 
Dinky Wit started popping off about the rivalry. It's no rivalry. In order for this to be a rivalry, they would kind of have to start beating us, and they can't beat us. And I'm thinking that's kind of a terrible thing to say to a new coach that he's at the job for the first time, and he comes to your place and almost beats you. What? Why are you doing that? Can you imagine Sam Pittman saying that? He would never. I mean, look at what he said after the A&M game. He had to be tremendously disappointed. All he did was just compliment A&M, compliment you know, Jim, Jimbo Fisher. Yeah. He never, he's got all these free friends in the media. They all like him. And I'm not saying Eli Drinkwitz has to be like that, but why are you popping off and saying something like that? So if it's a choice between Harson, who I think is kind of getting the, the raw deal and Dinky Wits, come on. All right. And it looked like Dinky Wits was going to win. And then at the last minute he didn't win because they fumbled the ball out of bounds on a, in, a, in an overtime period on a two point, uh, in an overtime thing, fumbled it out of bounds, yeah. and suddenly they're in trouble. Yeah. So, yeah, I got what I wanted. But that's a long explanation of why I would root for one team over the other when I don't really like either one of those teams. But any one of them play Arkansas, then you. Well, I mean, I'm not an Auburn fan. Yeah. The best I know thing you're that could not. happen to Harson is they could fire him and let him go get another job where he's not working for a bunch of goobers that fire other coaches every they get a coach and two years later get out of here. Yeah, well, that's that's Auburn for you. That's so, right. Anyways, that is gonna do it this week for this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.